Welcome to the Touch MBA Admissions Podcast. Do you need help figuring out which schools to apply to or how to get into the world's top MBA programs? Hey, you're not alone. Join thousands of others on this podcast and on our site, touchmba.com, as they seek the admissions edge. And now, here's your host, Darren Joe. Hey guys, Darren here. Welcome to the Touch MBA podcast. It's really good to have you here with us. A couple episodes ago, I interviewed Yvonne Kerbel, who was the former career services director for the Yale School of Management. Uh, And it was a very well-received episode. And one of our listeners actually commented on that episode and she wrote, I'm hoping that you spend some time in the near future discussing non-traditional post-MBA career choices. Things such as social impact, social entrepreneurship, nonprofit, government, public policy, and corporate social responsibility. So I took Lily's uh, comments to heart and I wanted to do an episode on social impact careers for MBAs. And by social impact, I define that broadly to include all the things that Lily mentioned in her note. And when I was thinking about you know who I would want on the show, I thought about perhaps reaching out to career services director of, of Yale or you know another top school like Oxford, Said or Harvard or Stanford that knows this space really well. But I also thought it might be as instructive to talk to someone who has gone through this entire process. So I was reminded of my good friend, Pin Chin Kwok, who's a Singaporean. And Pin and I met over 10 years ago. And at the time, she was thinking of applying to an MBA because she wanted to switch from finance to a career in social impact. Pin ended up attending UC Berkeley Haas. She graduated in 2009 and now has been working in the space for about seven years. So I thought, who better to learn from than her? So what we do during this episode is walk through her journey as an applicant, as a student, and as an alumni and discuss the things MBA applicants who want to pursue social impact careers should look for at each stage of that journey. I hope you enjoy this conversation. It's really just kind of an open chat between two good friends about these questions, uh, and I hope you get a lot of value from it. Here at Touch MBA, we specialize in school selection help, helping you figure out which top programs fit you best, helping you assess your competitiveness at your target programs. And so if you want some free help there, go head over to touchmba.com. That's right, we have a website and you can get some free school recommendations and advice there. And now on to my discussion, my chat with Pin Chin Kwok. Pin, welcome to the Touch MBA podcast. Well, thank you. Yeah, and um, it's my pleasure to be here. You know, I'm just I'm just excited to share my my journey and and even you know those uh, people I've known on the journey with me to see if it you know that that helps um, others and theirs. So so thank you. Yeah. So could you just give us kind of a quick background on you know what you were doing before your MBA, where you went for your MBA, and uh, what you've done since. I started my career in Citigroup in, in New York in a leadership program. It, you know, it was a great program. I, they, they taught me a lot and, and, and they taught me so many lessons, lessons I'm still applying today. But I must say, I don't know if Darren knew this, before Haas, um, actually five years into my career, I was at Crossroads. I knew that um, I didn't really want to do what I was doing anymore or stay in banking in, in a traditional sense. And I had applied, actually, um, for an MBA. I got into a couple of schools and good schools and actually accepted a couple of slots. Um, but somehow just I was going because I knew I didn't want to be doing what I was doing, but I didn't really have a direction. And um, after serious consideration, even putting money down to reserve my spot, I ended up not going because I didn't feel that that was uh, the right investment to just go to MBA because I didn't like what I was doing. So I managed to get a rotation actually from Citigroup. They were kind enough and generous enough to move me from New York back to Singapore. And I thought, hey, that'd be exciting. I'd learn about business in Singapore. I mean, it was really enjoyable and a great learning experience for another couple of years. And same thing happened 
two years down, another two years down the road, so my seven years in now, I realized that, you know, one could make enough money living in, in banking, um, as I think all of us might agree. But I felt that I, I just, the sense of meaning wasn't there. I'm not putting down any banking careers at all. I just, for me personally, I really enjoyed it and had great experiences, great bosses, you know, great colleagues. I just felt that I needed something with a little bit more meaning. And so I, I started to explore a career with more s- social impact. I really didn't know what that meant. I, you would laugh, actually. I, I sat at my desk and I Googled back then uh, careers with impact, you know, and things like that. And I got, you know, social responsibility, just, just a very narrow s- set of options. And I was sitting in Asia, and this was obviously, you know, in 2005, and the field just wasn't mature. So there weren't many options. And actually, one of our... Um, good uh, mutual friends said to me one day, um, there's a lot more out there. And, you know, Berkeley has is one of those schools. Why don't you look it up? And I, I did. I did. And looked at the website. I really liked the sort of the values they put forth. Uh, I really liked what they offered uh, with, with, you know, the social entrepreneurship options. All of that was new to me. Uh, so I applied and I applied to only one school, which is obviously not a great strategy. Oh my gosh, that just breaks all my like admissions advice right there, that you only apply to one school. Uh, yeah, no, Darren, so I admit that I, I done the previous round, I applied to six schools. So so there. So it's, 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 it's second round for me, I took a big risk, but I think I was really, really passionate. And I said to myself, if this is what I want to do, if I don't get in, I'll figure out other Options because remember, and back then, uh, more than ten years ago, there weren't many schools that offered you know social impact, like a variety of options for social impact, right? And not just nonprofit, for example. And I wanted just a broad exposure. That's that's why. So I didn't just want to apply to any other school that didn't offer what I was looking for. So at that point, there were very few schools um, that offered it. So I still agree with Darren. <laughs> you need to apply to a variety. Uh, because that tells you a lot too when you go through an application process. I think when you answer the questions and you really do your research, it, it informs, uh, it, it, it plays mirror to what you think you want as well. So I agree with Darren, absolutely. But back then, so I did that um, and very thankfully I got in and that completely opened my world. Um, and I can obviously get into a bit more of that later, Darren, but it did give me what I wanted. And uh, since then, I've been doing a variety of things. I spent a few years um, in social enterprise. Uh, working with rather big names, often just as internships or um, three to four month consulting stints with, uh, you know, the likes of Ashoka was one of them. There's some local Bay Area so social enterprises that have been around for a decade. I worked with a social impact assessment firm, uh, one of the pioneers for that, and really just try to explore what role I could play. Then I came back to Singapore, uh, to Asia, to figure out, you know, along with a couple of other partners, whether we could really be pioneers in this field and scale social enterprises. Uh, another story, but we were a little ahead of our time, and I realized that I wasn't going to achieve a lot of impact. So I <clears throat> moved on, actually, to a uh, interesting role in healthcare. I asked myself, I really wanted to achieve scaled impact. What are some industries out there where people are already doing things, and I could potentially try to make a difference in a more accelerated path than trying to build an entire industry that didn't really exist six years or five or six years ago. So I did that and I was in Medtronic's business model innovation team for three and a half years and now doing similar things at um, Lumen Lab, which is MetLife's innovation lab, uh, working on health innovation. So for me, the definition of social impact um, has actually broadened, but I feel that I've been on the same journey all along and trying to achieve impact uh, with what I have. That kind of provides us the outline uh, for what we're going to discuss uh, in the podcast. So we're going to walk through each stage of PIN's journey, and uh, hopefully we won't bring back uh, too many bad memories, all, all good memories, but um, <laughs> through each stage from being an applicant to being a student and then to working in, in this industry. Let's start with when, again, uh, your friend told you you should look at UC Berkeley Haas. They have uh, a lot of options for someone like you. What do you think now, after you know having gone 
through that program, not just applied to it, but gone through it. What do you think applicants need to think about when deciding on which schools to target, right? Because they have this idea like you that they want to have a career in social impact. They want more meaning. How should they go about their search? Yeah, no, that's that's a good question. I get that quite a lot from people I meet um, applying for MBAs. Most times, I think people will go obviously to you know either rankings for the, the, the areas interested in, and then they go to school's website, which I think is important because uh, you know how a school writes about itself, its values, uh, what it prides itself on is is rather telling, I believe. But that I think least scratches the surface. I think there are a few other things one should look at. Depending on the industry you want to go into, where the school is located, I think it's really important because uh, many, well, many of the class needs to end up probably staying in, in, in that area, in that geography. That, that connection is really important. I'll, I'll explain that in a while. But the other reason for um, thinking about the geography is, as an example, what I was looking at, you know, social impact. Again, remember this was a number of years back, so the options were a little more limited. But the Bay Area, you know, has been pioneering social enterprise, social impact. It's not the only place, obviously, for a while. So um, there were lots of players who have been there for a decade or more. It's also, so it's much easier to find people to talk to, much easier to network, much easier to find internship opportunities because they're right in your backyard from school, right? And as a student, you can knock on doors and say, hey, I'm really interested. Could I do something for you for the semester, for example? And I did a lot of that, which really exposed me to how organizations work and also taught me about what I could add, how I could add value in the space. So I think geography is big. I think the uh, other things like class size, which is probably talked about quite a bit. And again, I think the pros and cons uh, to each, but just think about, you know, what kind of environment you would thrive in. There's some schools that are much bigger and you obviously get a much larger network after school, but think about how the school is structured. Do, people, do you really get to know, you know, all 1,000, for example, of your classmates? Or are you somebody who thrives in a much smaller, tighter type of environment, right? There's no, there's no right answer to that, but I think that's something else to, to think about as well because networking is, I think, I'm sure Darren would have discussed at other points. You know, you, you go to business school a lot for the networks <laughs> that you build, right? So that's really important. So I think I covered the key points. I would say, obviously, if you get a chance to visit, which may be a luxury for, you know, for many, uh, that's important too, because then you get a real taste of what the school is like, how warm they are, or, you know, how helpful they are. There's some things that are less tangible. I would say you would want to try to talk to students, uh, uh, current students. I think that's really important. So I'll give an example. Uh, again, this is a number of years ago, but when I was thinking about social impact, it wasn't as mature, developed, and quote-unquote industry and so you know it was very hard for I think the career services of most schools to really help you figure out a path and find opportunities because there just weren't that many well-trodden paths right and that many opportunities like in more standard industries like consulting or finance but when you talk to students and you ask them about these really tricky things they'll be able to tell you what's going on really behind the scenes right so for example for, for me at Haas there was a very tight group of students who were really interested in social and environmental impact. And when it came to the second year, we all got together and formed a bit of a, you know, self-help group of sorts. We shared our contacts with each other. We shared our, uh, the open positions we heard about with each other. Uh, and these things were really, really helpful, I know, to so many of us, right? And these are the things you may not read about on a website, for example, um, and that even talking to admissions, may not, they may not think about it. But when you talk to existing current students, uh, maybe on a similar path, you get to hear some of these things that are going on behind the scenes. So I think that's, if you can try to do that, that'd be really important. Yeah, I think that's that's the great foundation. And, but what like attracted you to Haas in, in terms of like hard infrastructure? Was it because they had more courses in this area or like a certain faculty member or two or three or Oh, okay. Yeah. Do, do you know what I mean? Like, was there something that really drew you in comparison to, you know, those other good schools that you got admitted to a couple years earlier? Yes. Sorry. I actually totally missed that one. Haas had a couple of uh, professors that were really well known in the social enterprise and um, uh, corporate social responsibility space. So like Kelly McLehaney, you know, she's really well reputed in this field and really uh, connected. So 
that's a draw because as I mentioned earlier, obviously good professors are always very important, but in an industry, in a space where paths, career paths are not as well established and opportunities are fewer, having the right professors who have the right networks in industry is really important besides the content they deliver clearly. Um, so how is it a couple of those? I think in terms of the curriculum, again, I saw, uh, you know, the most breadth in the social impact type courses uh, there as well. And, you know, I was looking for exposure. I was looking to have my world, you know, opened up. And so that breadth um, was really important, too. Do you remember how you applied or positioned yourself as someone from this finance background looking to get into this, you know, new field? Wow, Darren, you're really testing come on, my come memory. On, come on. <laughs> Let me see. I think I do remember a couple of key things. I think the two things that I that still stand up for me today, you know, one was I think, you know, a certain level of authenticity. So, you know, my career was, you know, full on in 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 banking, clearly. But during my path, I realized that, you know, I'd found myself always involved in something social. It, you know, it wasn't just, oh, this is convenient. This is one community thing I'm going to do. And I stuck to it. You know, every year to two, I, I found an interesting nonprofit organization for which I, I contributed a lot of time to. And so I think that was one way of showing them that that's always been some of that in me. I That was the only way I knew how to channel it. But I, I, I wanted to channel it a lot more. So I think one was that just, and obviously everyone has a different story for that, right? But there's that level um, of authenticity, Another one was actually a moment, and I think that moment is, was really striking then, and it still is to me. I was actually, to be honest, through my search in something more meaningful, you know, besides applying to for MBA, I also uh, looked at a few other different kinds of jobs, just really to test out what I wanted, right? Because I think when you go for interviews, you, you get very honest with yourself on what you want. And um, through one of those interviews, I recalled, I was sitting there waiting. The person who was supposed to interview, interview me was terribly late. I actually left the office, walked across the street to buy a magazine to read, came back, and I sat there and I read this one story about the known that the, the yogurt water company and Mohammed Yunus and the social enterprise that set up. I, it's a pretty well known story. It's one of the pioneering stories. I, I devoured the whole story, and you know, honestly, my interview it still hadn't got shown, which is a good thing. And I just sat there. It was a moment, and and I just said to myself, "Why am I at this interview? Why?" I really, really, really want to do this. I really want to explore this. And it just, it was just a moment. And I think, you know, we all have mo different moments like that. And I use that in my application as well. It, I think it's a, for me, it was a combination. I didn't have a whole lot. It's not like I had a, a very big role, a leadership role in a nonprofit, right? So I had small stories for many years along the way. And I was honest about that. But I had a big moment, a moment big enough such that when I had the realization, I, you know, I almost didn't continue with my interview because I felt so much about wanting to explore this new space. So I think those are the two two big things I used. That's just great advice for anyone writing their essays. I mean, just as a side note, yeah, focus on, on the scene, right? Where you have those big realizations. I mean, me just listening to that story, which I never knew, it's quite powerful. It's really powerful. Oh, actually, sorry. And I told you my memory would fail me. There was a third. There was a third I thought would be important to share just quickly was while I was at City, actually in my last year, I had embarked on a project to um, use, you know, uh, finance for, um, you know, the overseas foreign workers in Singapore and remittance and all that. Now, you know, there are many startups doing that now, but this was again many, many years ago. And I actually um, pushed my boss to let me work on one of those projects, you know, obviously with only 5% of my time, right? So, you know, that's another way, you know, that's, that, that was me sort of following my heart. And being trying to be a bit of an entrepreneur uh, before I really knew what that, that word meant. So I think I, I kind of shared the story as well in my application. Yeah, so you showed that there's there's a track record behind it too. Like you said, it wasn't just a, a one-off thing, even though it was quite a big jump. And then, so now let's move along the path. You're now at UC Berkeley Haas. I go visit you, I stay with you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I sleep on your floor. I see you studying late at night at your desk with books piled all around you. 
I, I still vividly remember that, um, that. Wow, I've forgotten that, but okay. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's like, interestingly, like the one thing I remember is, okay, let's start with you securing internships with some big names in the space that you mentioned, like Apple and Ashoka. What did you do to lock down those internships? Well, let me just broaden the definition first, because I think internships are usually, you know, in the summertime or very fixed periods and they're official internship postings. I I took a really broad definition of that word. Um, Basically, I think from almost from the very first semester, I started to explore working with companies outside of internships because, you know, in a two year program, you get one chance at an internship in the summer. And I just for me, for someone switching careers that just wasn't enough uh enough for me to gain experience and sound credible but also enough for me to figure out how i fit in this new space so my formal internship was at apple doing supplier responsibility so that that was that but and that was during the summer or at a different time that was during okay no that was during the summer but what i did was to actually try to secure Uh, projects during the semester so sometimes for credit sometimes not I would reach out um, to companies I was interested in so I kind of drop a list of companies within the social impact space but again different right some more enablers some foundations uh, social impact assessments so on and so forth and I said I really want to figure out how these companies work what they do what value they add what value I add to them and um, you know what being a student it's easy right you you knock on doors and you say, hey, I'm a student, you know, well, for me, from Haas, right? And clearly in, in, in the Bay Area, they, they would know that. And I'm really interested in exploring ABC. I, I read this about your organization. I was wondering if I could do a project for you during the semester. And you know what? It's free labor for them. So <laughs> unless they had a really good reason... No, I'm kidding. But it's, it's, it's a chase, right? You're interested in companies. Um, but my point was whole, my whole point was that, you know, in, in, for internships, you're, you're fighting for one slot, right, at something. But during the semester, you, you're offering your time and your thoughts, your, te- your intelligence uh, to companies you're genuinely interested in. And, you know, most times people say yes, right? I mean, do your research, obviously, beforehand to figure out where you think there might be a couple of interesting spots. Don't just go and say, hey, I want to do a project. You know, suggest a couple of different projects you could do. You could be off, you could be wrong, but they would appreciate that you thought through um, how you could add value, right? Even if it's a four-month uh, stint. So I actually did um, at least at least one per semester, despite the fact that, you know, we're all crazy busy doing MBA, right? So, so I did that, yeah. And and uh, and and let me also share that you know some were obviously big names in that space, you know. And Darren's mentioned a couple of them, but I also went for skill sets. So, for example, I uh, could tell and I felt very strongly that design thinking would be very applicable in the um, social impact space. And I think many of you who follow the space would know that because IDEO form IDEO.org. But guess what? I worked with IDEO before IDEO.org was formed. I just knocked on the doors and I said, I'm really interested in learning more about this, this, um, this skill, this expertise. And I figured out a project uh, with a lady who was surprise, surprise, was also personally interested in the nonprofit social impact space. And we actually created a um, project for me to interview a whole list of big time nonprofits uh, all over the world and also IDEO designers to try to put together what nonprofits need and design thinking skill set. And, you know, I would love to say this and I will just because it, you know, it makes me feel good. But I, I believe that that contributed, you know, like a 0.01 percentage IDEO.org being formed, right? So the lady I worked with actually started IDEO.org after that. It's just an example of really thinking through um, how you want to play a role in this in social impact space, what kind of skill sets are needed, what do you already have, what you need to add to your repertoire, and trying to find an opportunity with companies um, that would give you at least an exposure to the skill set and maybe a name to put in your resume, right? Yeah, so sorry, that was a really sort of long way of getting to your your question, Darren, but you know, I don't think it's just about, you know, applying for your internship and clearly what I did in the two semesters before my summer uh, internship I'm sure that helped me secure my you know supplier responsibility internship at Apple 
Oh, that's brilliant. I love that. And and when you were reaching out to these different organizations, how much was it how much of it was done through the Haas network or was it you literally like cold calling or cold emailing people with these uh, project ideas? A lot of it was through Haas, for sure. I think that though I think that was my whole point about being situated in the right in the right kind of location or geography. It started, you know, with one or two and a lot of times people in the space are naturally helpful. So uh, if conversations went well, that's great. If they didn't go as well, they weren't we weren't so aligned with our goals, uh, they often referred me to another person. So the change just, you know, just 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 went on. But you know, Haas was very helpful. Career services looked up a few different alumni in uh, in the space that I was interested in, and you know they you know gave me names and obviously the Haas alumni email address, and everyone I wrote to responded. So that's the power of the network. Yeah, I remember. You know, it's funny. I have a horrible memory, and I remember you telling me something similar. I remember you saying something like, "Darren, it's the one time you're a student and you can get away with asking for these things." I mean, not so like not in such a sinister way, but like this is your one chance where, you know, people really also do want to help you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I'd say, you know, maximize (laughs) that opportunity. Clearly people want to help you because you are a student, but I think if you're, you know, hopefully situated in the right place where, you know, people often have, you know, companies doing these sorts of things tend to have, you know, relationships with the university. Right. So it's also helpful because they already have some kind of affiliation and when you reach out, it just makes it easier to do that. Yeah. Could you also talk a little bit about the competition that you helped organize? Um, because I think that like, it's important for applicants to consider not just courses, not just faculty, uh, not just like the internship and, and kind of uh, relationships the school has with these different organizations, but also like the student clubs, the competitions, like that side of things. I- I'm wondering if you could kind of reflect on on organizing that conference, if you could tell us more about it and, you know, how you think that helped you, if at all. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. I don't know if you've um, shared this, um, this, this rule or ratio. So they say when you go to business school, you spend a third of your time on your coursework. You spend a third of your time networking, socializing, networking with your... Um, classmates because that's what you built for life and you spend a third of your time on sort of um, these student clubs and activity leadership activities like that there's a reason for spending that much time on it I think it's a little unlike you know college or you know high school the student clubs I think give you two things in general one is it exposes you to that space because when you involved in organizing something it gives you sort of that and the right to reach out to leaders in the space right to con- to ask them to come and speak and so on and so forth so it gives you an in to to meeting people uh so that's that really enhances the networking aspect but uh the other thing it gives you is leadership right true leadership because again you're not young anymore um you're amongst all your peers right to to really take a leadership role i think means a lot it, te- it teaches you a lot more um, after having worked for a few years, uh, probably in relatively junior roles, right, out of college. So it really gives you a chance at leadership. And obviously, it's important that you put it on your resume as well. If you're looking, you know, if you, you weren't from that industry or that space to say that you led something, right? So, uh, but specifically, I uh, was one of the two co-chairs for the Global Social Venture Competition. I think if I'm not wrong, you know, Haas Berkeley was one of the pioneering schools for it, um, any sort of impact-related business plan competition. There are obviously business plan competitions in every school, in every business school, but House is one of the first few. So it's, it was really uh, well known. That gave me everything I said earlier, but you know, it really, as co-chair, allowed me to reach out to very senior people in the space. Uh, it gave me a reason to talk to them. It gave me a reason to introduce myself to them. And that has, that completely just opened up my networks. Yeah, that was, you know, really, really, really important. But as part of being responsible for a conference, it also taught me a lot about various aspects, various functions, sorry, for example, impact assessment, for example, even just, you know, marketing functions that you may find in a regular company. But as you can imagine, if you're only, you know, three to five years out of undergraduate, when you work in a company, you learn 
I need to have been exposed to maybe a couple of functions, right? If let's say you're in a rotation program, if you weren't, you might have been a similar department. The success of such an event or a club is completely dependent on the students. You know, the um, obviously administration was there to support, but the students really ran it at Haas. So you, you took on a real level of responsibility on top of your coursework in making sure something like this succeeded. And for me, I kind of took a co-chair role. So it, me- it meant that I had oversight over all the functions, you know, the mentors, the marketing, the fundraising, the um, impact assessment. Clearly, I was not an expert at all of them, that's for sure. But it gave me an exposure to all of that. And I think it really just opened my mind to what leadership meant as well. It changed my world at Haas. It made me really, really, really busy. So I remember that. <laughs> and I would encourage, you know, students to be very, very active on campus. It's it it's really it's why you're there really. Let's move from you did those internships both free and paid, you know, during the summer and during the semesters. You know, you built up your network there. You also helped co-chair uh, this uh, social venture competition. You also built up your network and, and your skill set there as well, met a lot more people. And then now you're looking to get a job. Could you tell us, yeah, like what, what was your thinking there? What did you end up doing? I was a little bit unconventional. Uh, when I was about to graduate, I, I, I realized that I still didn't know enough about space that I, I knew nothing about before school. There were a number of opportunities, but, you know, as mentioned, there weren't, like, that many, right? And they weren't as structured. So I, I said to myself, if I found a very exciting role that paid, that was ideal. But my, my primary objective uh, was to continue figuring out the value at what I brought to the space. So I also searched for roles, whether or not they were permanent, that were further add to my knowledge and my skill set. And I ended up doing that. So I had, um, I don't remember exactly, you know, maybe four different stints uh, a year after. I also gave myself clearly a time, like, you, you know, you're not really paid when you do four month stints, right? Fresh out of school. I, I did end up getting stints at well-known social enterprises or enabling organizations like Impact Assessment, as I mentioned before. Um, so I actually ended up doing that for a year. I, I was really passionate about impact assessment and I actually ended up doing, I think, almost a year worth of work in one of the com- in one of those companies uh, that was a pioneer in this in the Bay Area. And I think at that point, I got to some crossroads. You know, obviously, you know, life is never so black and white. So and I was I was dating somebody at Haas who was a year behind me. And so uh, the year that I spent exploring he was finishing up his second year, and when he was done, we made a decision to actually, he was also interested in social impact, so let me say that. And so we both decided to really get underground experience um, overseas in an emerging market. Uh, that was the goal. We, we felt that we had met so many successful social enterprises and enabling organizations in impact, and uh, we could stay in the Bay Area forever. That would be really lovely. But we felt that if we didn't leave then, we never would. And we felt that in the social impact space, to really get on the ground experience was critical. So you're not just, you know, sitting in an ivory tower coming up with theories on how you could save the world, right? You really get on the ground and learn. And so we did. So, we, uh, you know, I, I didn't end up securing, you know, the permanent position uh, in the Bay Area. And we left. So shall I continue or? Well, yes, I do want to continue, like, from when you came back to Asia, but... I think there's a really key question here, and that is this. How did you resist the herd mentality of business school when it's so expensive, you're there, your time's so valuable, all your classmates are going into these high paying consulting finance jobs? I mean, even though that's where you're from, right? How did you stick with your guns to continue on this path to learn more about, you know, like you said, you could add value to learn more about where you wanted to end up still determined to be in the space. Because I think, I think that's a really difficult thing to do. I was really passionate about it. Um, everything I learned, yeah, everything I learned really excited me. And I think what was encouraging was the opportunities, right? Um, you know, while I was in school, even when I was done with school, I 
uh, whenever I wanted to explore something, an organization, a particular function in the impact space, um, I managed to get roles, right? Uh, clearly, none of them were permanent, but I didn't want them to be permanent, right? I wanted to keep learning. So I think, you know, the fact that I, I, I could get what I was looking for further encouraged me. And also, I think, you know, I attended a lot of social impact conferences in the Bay Area. Bay Area. They were really well organized, well attended. And, you know, I saw so many people from mainstream uh, industries move into social impact. So, you know, just that exposure, uh, the, the continual exposure kept me going. I mean, it kept my excitement there. It kept my inspiration there. And it showed me that it was possible, right? So I think um, all of that helped. And, you know, I don't, let, let's not be, you know, unrealistic, right? It helped that, you know, I had some savings. So I didn't need to immediately get, you know, a full-time job to survive, right? So, you know, not everyone has that luxury, I'm well aware. But one thing to note too is obviously if you have a little bit of of time before you apply and get into school, think about that a little bit, right? If you want to explore, exploration takes a little bit of time. Obviously, if you go into business school within those two years, you find something awesome, that's great. But you do want to be fair to yourself if you're investing so much in a career switch in something new and you don't find something so ideal yet given it's not a fully structured industry and career paths, you know, aren't well trodden, you might want to just save up a little bit so that you have a, you know, just a little bit of buffer, right? That you're not pressurized to take a role after having invested all that money and two years of your life trying to switch. Everyone has different life and financial circumstances, but it's just something to, if you have a bit of time to, to think about, right? It just it just gives you a bit more wiggle room. I, I can only imagine just, you know, even though, you know, you are dating a guy, you're still in the Bay Area, you're still doing these great things. I would just feel like that pressure. Oh, man, I got to get a high paying job, you know, like, <laughs> did the thought at least cross your mind? Well, you know what's funny? It's because I came from that world, right? And I, you know, at that age, had a relatively well-paying job and I considered twice leaving. So I think for me, I had also tasted the other world and I just knew that it, it just, it didn't keep me. Yeah, no, that's so, sim simple enough. I'm not, obviously, yeah, and I'm not putting it down because, you know, like I said, and I still say today, you know, my, my well-paying job at City didn't just pay me well taught me a lot of important lessons and um i think i'm who i am today i'm where i am today because of some of those very foundational lessons that city taught me so that was invaluable right it's just that for me i knew that uh as an industry it wasn't going to keep me that's all uh, what trends are, are you seeing in this developing space I, that's my first question. My second question is, you know, are are the organizations you're working for looking to recruit MBAs and, and what sort of skills or attitudes are you looking for there as well? So I think there are a couple of ways to frame that. So one is obviously strictly within the social impact space. You know, it's, it's a lot more evolved than it was, you know, when I left school, clearly. I think the variety of jobs there are, is much broader. You know, in terms of trends, I think it's been a bit of a wave as in, again, it depends on which, also which geography I've been in Asia now for a number of years. So let me just focus a little bit more on that. Uh, but I'm sure, you know, the, the, the trend is not too dissimilar elsewhere. I think there was a lot of sort of excitement and hype earlier on. There was a lot, in a real way, right? People were very inspired. There were a few great success cases and a lot of people have been experimenting. And I think, you know, over a few years, and there was a lot of, um, for example, social investment fun starting and people experimenting with that you know i think uh, there was then a period where there's a bit of realism you know realism not as in oh this is not going to work but realism and people delve deeper into hey there's been great ideas there's been money put in here why is it we're not seeing the scaling that's required so again you know obviously i'm not strictly in the social impact space now so but what I see um, from the outside is, in terms of the funding, it's gotten more nuanced. People have really looked at, you know, what size funding is is needed versus what's been there. People have tried to compare it to, you know, the, the VC industry and in sort of more mainstream mainstream industries. Sorry, and um, and I think so. The funding has gotten more nuanced, more sophisticated. So that that's that's one thing. So I think it's an interesting area to be in. I think the other one is, you know, there's been a lot of conversations around scaling, as I was mentioning earlier. I think there's been, there always has been, you know, by pioneers like Ashoka, but I think, you know, there's been more thinking around, you know, how can we 
really scale impact, maybe not just through straight up funding alone, but through uh, interesting collaborative partnerships with, you know, other sectors, other sectors could be, uh, you know, private sector or government. So I think you see more people trying those things out now. I think the question really the last years has been, how do you scale? There's a lot of kind of talk around that, a lot of action around it, a lot of learnings around that. Um, so that's sort of one way of answering that question. The other way, and maybe this is a little bit more of a personal journey, is for me, I've asked myself, well, how do you define impact, right? I was taking on various roles in social enterprises, and then I was in enabling organizations like Im- Impact Assessment. And then uh, also I was doing some, I spent quite a bit of time with Volans as well, based out of the UK. Sorry, what does Volans do? Just so. Volans? Yeah, so you know, so Volans, you know, looks at scaling, actually. They've, they've had a few publications out there, and you obviously can look them up online on um, what, which are the, uh, what, what kinds of impact organizations have scaled? How do you partner with corporations? So there's a lot of that angle over there for Volans. And that was my personal passion as well. And then, sorry, then I've gone to start, up, start my own social enterprise, um, trying to scale other social enterprises to being in an impact consulting firm. And for me, where I've landed is, you know, as I mentioned earlier briefly, I landed in an industry that in and, in and of itself, has a lot of impact, which is healthcare, right? So I think as a personal journey, I, I've kind of gone through that route uh, because, you know, for obviously for various reasons, uh, I think a couple of times we were ahead of our time in, in Asia. So I wouldn't say we succeeded. I learned a lot from, you know, my 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 uh, failures, if you put it that way. But I got tired of just um, moving from one social enterprise organization to another. And um, I just said, I really... I really want to have an impact. How do I do it? So I decided to find an established industry with impact, right? And for me, I was fortunate because for me, it's personally, again, it's not just about selling an existing, you know, either medical technology or pharmaceutical device. Uh, I managed to find roles in innovation in healthcare. So, you know, what that's, again, is a overused word today and very fuzzy, right? But when, when I say that in healthcare, I've really been looking at outcomes-based care. So how do you come up with more holistic solutions that are scalable, that really show an improvement in outcomes. And and I'm really, really excited about that right now because, you know, I'm in Lumen Lab and it's, you know, our parent company is an insurance company, actually. And, and there's absolute alignment because if we succeed in outcomes-based um, innovations, then it could potentially help create new insurance products, cover people who have never been covered before, help provide greater financial protection when things happen, right? So, so you know, as, you know, it's a long way of answering uh, your question as well, but I think there are trends within the social impact space and we could follow those trends and figure out what excites us, absolutely. But also as a personal journey, you know, given, again, social impact careers are not all that well established it would be good to sometimes revisit and ask yourself what does impact mean to you how do you really want to achieve impact how do you enjoy impact right do you want to be out in the field uh talking to people or for me you know what excites me is systemic change so i'm on a path i am right now um and i think you know with the way healthcare is globally with the way the world is globally i think there are many organizations that have, you know, Innovation Labs. So that's a huge trend. Obviously, there are proponents of Innovation Labs. There are people who criticize Innovation Labs. But I would say that may be an interesting um, area to think about because that inherently tells you you're trying to disrupt something that's not working so well, right? I'm an industry that could, can, could do a lot more, right? So that might be interesting to think about impact. Oh, that's, that's really interesting because, I, I mean, I know that there's been a huge increase in spending from like U.S. and U.K. companies uh, in terms of corporate social responsibility. But I don't know if what you're doing fits within that. That's what you're doing sounds to me more like, I mean, the straight up developing, developing new products, right? Or innovations. Yes. So, so but yes. that's, that seems to be, that's also really interesting. Yeah, well, I picked an industry that inherently has impact, right, in healthcare. So if we develop new products, that gets to at least my end goal. But actually, let me let me touch on something really quickly since you brought it up. And I suppose the, this reason it was in top of mind when you asked me that is corporate social responsibility. Actually, it was my first 
option um, um, or, or the first option that I was exposed to even before business school when it came to careers with impact. Uh, and I still try to follow that space and I still go to some events sometimes for corporate social responsibility. Uh, I, this is obviously my personal opinion. I, I don't think the field has moved too much since you know since the, my, my days in, in business school. And I think that's more a structural reason in most companies than than the field itself, right? I believe in the field. I really believe in the field. I was doing supplier responsibility at Apple, right? And this is not so much, you know, my opinion on where the industry should go, but more to just, I think, suggest um, to candidates to uh, look at the structure. If they're really interested in corporate social responsibility, look at the organizational structure, right? See uh, who the head of CSR reports into, see how much influence and power they have. Because there are some organizations I know that do have really interesting, really meaningful, really impactful CSR programs. But I would say that's more the exception than the norm that I've personally come across, right? And I do know of certain individuals who have gone through that path and done it for two or three years and been disappointed and left as well. Again, I am not criticizing the industry at all. I just feel that sometimes because of organizational um, structure challenges, I have seen more of my friends and colleagues disappointed after a couple of years so just investigate investigate where the csr department sits and that should give you an idea of um how strategic it could be or it's you know it's or certain companies use it to merely kind of sound good and look good right so just be careful that's all uh it still has potential but i would say uh, I, i would investigate that that's great advice and would you have any final advice for applicants who want to pursue social impact careers, you know, af- after their MBAs or through their MBAs? Yeah, actually, just this one thing. I This this was advice I was given uh, when I was at Haas, and I, I still think about it a lot. And it may describe actually a little bit of my personal journey is try to think about it from a checkerboard approach. That, you know, what does that mean? So, you know, that again, it means not thinking, not taking a linear approach to it, right? Again, again, because this industry is not well-trodden. So it's really exciting in that sense. But checkerboard could mean a few different things. It could mean what I did, um, try different functions, right? Move left, move right. It could even mean, and actually what it really meant when that person told me that was a switch to move from social impact, move from uh, nonprofits, go into private sector, right? Go back, go into government, go back. Um, that exposure is really important because I think as many of us who have explored the social impact field know, you know, these um, pressing problems in the world are very complex. And a lot of times one entity, one, one entity or even one sector cannot solve it alone. Um, and that's why you have, you know, like Ashoka has been having its hybrid value chain initiative for many, many years now, right? That's what it's about, right? Partnerships across sectors. So, but by personally being in different sectors as well, I think it really enhances your skill set, right? So, you know, a lot of who I am today, like I said a couple of times already earlier, you know, came from professional training at Citigroup. A lot of my design thinking, my sense of humility came from doing on the ground work in the base of the pyramid markets uh, in social enterprise. And that taught me a lot about really understanding people's needs. And so I think today, you know, I kind of am where I am today uh, doing healthcare innovation because I get what people need or what they need, but they don't say they need. That came from my nonprofit underground training, right? I get trying to set up a new healthcare business because a lot of my work from Citigroup and from consulting taught me a lot about strategy, right? And then my time, you know, at Medtronic at a real med tech company taught me about finding value in an ecosystem so you know i could go on and on about this clearly but the idea is you probably move a lot faster and have a much richer experience if you don't think about your your career and social impact in a linear fashion let's end on that That, that, that's great stuff thank you so much pin for being on the show and i i really enjoyed it thank you yeah no i really enjoyed it too and I, i hope some of that was was helpful thank you Thanks for listening to the Touch MBA podcast. 
don't be shy. We have a mailing list. Go to touchmba.com and get yourself signed up. And we'll keep you posted with the best tips and insider interviews on how to get into your number one school. You can also find us on Twitter and Facebook at TouchMBA. See you soon.